Um, Claudia, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here today. And thank you so much to Claudia and Piers for inviting me to speak today. I'm um, really looking forward to all of your um, comments and questions. Today, I will be discussing Spanish artist Victor Patricio Landaluce's fascination with depicting women of mixed Spanish and Afro-Cuban heritage, known within the period as mulatas, a fascination or one might call obsession, which began in the 1860s and continued throughout the rest of his career. Landaluce's depictions diverge from the typical characterizations of Afro-Cuban women prevalent during this period. Rather, his portrayals of mulata women, such as those uh, seen here, oh, sorry, um, seen here on the left, share extremely strong similarities with Goya's depictions of Spanish majas, women of lower classes in Madrid, such as seen here on the right. Comparing the work of these two artists demonstrates La Mulata's significance for Landaluce as more than simply a character type, but an expression of his Spanish origins. This talk will explore the complex legacy of Landaluce's fascination with the Cuban Mulata and argue for recognizing Landaluce's appropriation and intermixing with Caribbean costumbrismo of Goya's iconography of the Spanish Maja developed through his print series Los Caprichos. The result produced a female icon who has become one of the most influential images of Cuban identity. By comparing the work of Goya and Landaluce for the first time, I highlight the relationship between the mulata and the maja as parallel archetypes of femininity with vital significance to the identities of both Cuba and Spain. Examining Landaluce's mulata alongside Goya's maja illustrates the visual migration of icons across continents and the evolution of a figure of Spanish nationalism into one of Cuban independence. As a Spanish immigrant in Cuba, Landaluce offers the opportunity to examine a dialogue of imagery and iconography across the Atlantic, as well as the translation of fine art into new traditions that would provide the foundation for modern popular culture. And Luce, undoubtedly, um, for any of you who might be already familiar with him, has, an has a complicated legacy. Many of his works present negative and caricatured imagery of people of color. Landa Luce was a staunch believer that Cuba should remain a Spanish colony, and he worked as an illustrator for pro-Spanish anti-independence newspapers. However, Landaluce was one of the only artists of his time in Cuba who paid attention to or was concerned with representing its black and mulatto population, which by 1811 made up over 50% of the island. His paintings and prints are among the only remaining records we have of the life and culture of 19th century Afro-Cubans. His prolific output is uncontested as among the most detailed visual documentation of daily life of the period of Africans and Afro-Cubans on the island. The vast majority of Landaluce's work is now housed in the Museo de Bellas Artes de Cuba in Havana, although much is also known owned by Cernuda Arte Gallery in Miami. And I've been very lucky enough to make trips to see Landaluce's work in both of these places. Landaluce came to Cuba in 1850 and never returned to Spain. He dedicated his career to depicting in prints, watercolors, and paintings all aspects of Cuban life. Born in Bilbao in 1825, he began his artistic development in Madrid. As an aspiring printmaker trained in the Spanish Academy, Landaluce would have been deeply familiar with the legendary Goya and required to copy his work as an essential part of the curriculum of Madrid's Real Academia de San Fernando. After finishing at the Academia, Landaluce left Spain for Mexico and subsequently Cuba, most likely in order to differentiate himself from his peers. 
Latin America and the Caribbean were perceived as places lacking in artistic talent. And for a young Spanish artist emerging from the academy, an atmosphere in which he could more e easily distinguish himself. Landaluce created a wide variety of paintings and prints that attempted to divine, define the many new racial and social types he found in Cuba. Most famous is his series of costumbrista illustrations for the book Tico, Tipos y Costumbres de la Isla de Cuba from 1881. Here um, in the frontispiece, a mulatta woman um, alongside her male counterpart, the Calacero, are both prominently displayed along the left side of the frontispiece for Tipos y Costumbres. The book paired Landa Luce's illustrations with texts by a variety of Cuban intellectuals. Historian Antonio Bachier y Morales, the editor of the collection, was persecuted by the Spanish authorities for his public support of racial equality and Cuba's independence. Landa Luce's collaboration with Bachier y Morales departs from the pro-Spanish publications he traditionally illustrated for and was possibly an opportunity for him to demonstrate a more progressive understanding of Cuban and particularly Afro-Cuban identity. Landaluce's La Mulata del Rumbo, uh, seen here within Tipos in Costumbres, is accompanied by a story by Francisco de Paula Gilaber that begins with describing mulata women as, quote, she in her class, in her sphere, among her own, can be worth as much as any other. But the heterogeneous element that seduces her, that conquests her, that perverts her, is responsible for her faults, for her vices, for her unconcern." End quote. Here, Hilabert equates the mulatta's racial heterogeneity with a predisposition towards vice and indulgence, a theme that plays out throughout the rest of the text. In contrast, Landaluce's illustration depicts a mulatta woman, sorry, just, uh, mulatta woman within a composition traditionally reserved for upper-class European portraiture. She is elegantly adorned and dressed, gracefully gesturing with her fan, conveying the impression of a woman of refinement to the 19th century viewer who would have understood one's personal character as directly correlated to their physical appearance. Although her pose with her hand in the crook of her waist accentuates her voluptuousness, a trait used to illustrate the mulatta's alleged promiscuity, her gaze is not concerned with seducing the viewer, but occupied by something outside of the frame. Combined with her amused expression, Landa Luce portrays a woman of agency whose virtue is not dependent upon the desire of her white male viewer. There is a greater degree of realism in La Mulata de Rumbo than any of Landa Luce's other images of mulata women, creating the impression that he invited a real Afro-Cuban woman to pose within his studio as his muse, at least for this individual illustration and possibly for others. The print's caption, La Mulata de Rumbo, Rumbo referring to direction or movement, further implies her sense of autonomy and freedom to move throughout Havana, a privilege that in contrast would have been prohibited from most women. Landa Luce's image transforms the mulata into a figure who can no longer be easily read and confined. His emphasis on the ambiguity of her position highlights her power as a threat to the strict social boundaries between black and white, poor and rich, essential to maintaining Spanish authority in Cuba. By depicting a mulata dressed in the splendor of an upper-class Spanish woman, Landaluce reinforces her potency as more than just a beautiful figure for the bourgeois viewer, for the bourgeois viewer's visual consumption, alluding instead to her ability to actively resist as well as appropriate Spain's imperial culture to her own ends. Landaluce's mulata shares more visual similarities with Goya's majas than any other female figures produced by his Cuban contemporaries. Goya's Los Caprichos, published in 1799, was Spain's first contemporary satire by an artist of the court and presented an ideal model for Landaluce's own development of caricature 
of the types he found in Cuba. The Maha was a figure of central importance to Los Caprichos, defined as a woman, as women of the lower classes in Madrid, who were seen as distinctly Spanish and emerged as a symbol of Spanish nationalism, especially during the French invasion and occupation of Spain under Napoleon from 1807 to 1814. Goya, like Landaluce, contemplated the figure and significance of the Maha in both prints and paintings, such as his now famous picture as seen here in the collection of the Hispanic Society of his patron and muse, the Duchess of Alba, dressed as a Maha. After Los Caprichos, the Maha continued to be a recurring figure in Goya's paintings, becoming an internationally established icon of Spanishness and Spanish femininity that inspires pictures such as Manet's Olympia and reclining young women in Spanish costume. Like Mulatas, Mahas were also seen as destabilizing figures who threatened Spain's social hierarchy through their ability to make a duchess indistinguishable from a prostitute. The striking resemblance, striking resemblance between Landaluce's La Mulata y su Dueña and Goya's print from Los Caprichos, God Forgive Her and It Was Her Mother, suggests that Landaluce's painting was inspired by this very image. The provocative postures of both women are reversed, but almost identical. Both hold an open fan up in the air, um, an arm draped across their uh, torso as they lean backwards to accentuate their figure with a gaze directed at their beholder. Both women expose small dainty feet peeking out from below their dresses pointed outward to ensure the viewer notices their white high heeled shoe. This revelation of a woman's foot was understood in both Cuba and Spain as purposeful sexual innuendo. The flower shaw a manton de Manila draped over the arms of the mulata and the mantilla over the head of the maha indicate that they are in public locations and trespassing beyond their domestic confinements. This brazen defiance of standards of female decorum illustrates both women as willing to directly challenge the machismo culture that traditionally defined both Spain and Cuba. The caption of Goya's print, God forgive her and it was her mother, identifies this particular Celestina accompanying the Maha as not simply an elderly woman, but as a mother who prostitutes her daughter. Cuban literature similarly described the mulatas wanton behavior as a hereditary trait of their Afro-Cuban mothers who writers claimed had seduced their white fathers and trained their daughters to do the same. Like Goya uses the mother who turns away from us, Landaluce uses the uh, dueña to frame and draw attention to the mulata. The dueña in Landaluce's picture is analogously understood as a decaying of older woman who offers advice based on her experience as being once uh, young and beautiful herself. While the Celestina turns away from the viewer, covering herself as much as possible with her shawl, the dueña's crudely denoted facial features are almost entirely hidden by her brown tattered shawl, remaining slightly visible in order to further accentuate the mulata's beauty. The connotation of this pairing of younger and older women has led the mulata in Landaluce's painting to often be understood as a prostitute. However, the painting has also been previously titled La Señora y la Serviente de Paseo, The Lady and Her Servant on a Walk. The mulata's elegant and luxurious appearance makes her identity as a prostitute further uncertain, blurring the boundaries of class and again emphasizing the ambiguity of the mulata's social position. Landaluce reinforces the mulata's power to appropriate the culture of Cuba's dominant class to her own ends and liberate herself from the transparent appearances that were essential to maintaining Cuba's authority on the island. In other images of mulata women, Landaluce draws parallels between her courtship by the calesero and the, and the maja's pursuit by her male counterpart, the majo. In Goya's, even thus he cannot make her out, and in Landaluce's The Declaration of Love, 
the Maho and the Calicero lean forward to closely study the Maha and Mulata, who both coquettishly offer themselves up for inspection. Although Landaluce returns to more racist stereotypes in his depictions of the facial features of the Mulata and the Calicero in this particular watercolor, he highlights between the identical nature of, it makes a highlight between the identical nature of gender relations between Afro-Cubans and Spaniards. Goya's caption suggests that the Maho, despite holding a monocle over his eye, even thus cannot make her out and can never truly understand the Maha, alluding to the danger of her enigmatic character and the Maho's ignorance of the degree of power she is able to have over him. In Landaluce's watercolor, the mulatta's confident smile and her outstretched body that still pulls away ever so slightly also suggests the mulatta's ability to exercise her enchantment and disguise her true intentions. The wide-eyed voyeur behind the mulatta mimics the position of the woman sitting in the background of Goya's print. The expression of Landaluce's voyeur, of Landaluce's voyeur covering his mouth articulates the danger of the mulatta's inscrutable charm, while Goya's caption, even thus he cannot make her out, also warns the viewer, the viewer about the Maha's deceptions. Landaluce's Fiesta de Carnaval shows a scene of religious festivities outside of Havana. Given the mountains in the background, the location is possibly Guanabacoa, a town outside the city known for its important history with an Afro-Cuban religion of Santeria and home to the first African Calbindo, confraternities founded amongst the African slave population in Cuba, dating back to the 16th century. Landaluce depicts a scene of the carnival festivities the Calbindos were allowed by the Spanish authorities to organize once a year. At the right edge of the watercolor, Landaluce depicts a mulatta woman in a voluminous light blue gown with a long peach bow in profile, facing a similarly well-dressed man, possibly a calicero, bending over towards her with an outstretched hand. The composition and the figure's positioning in relationship to one another is almost identical to the lecturer's advantages in Goya's Los Caprichos print, Nobody Knows Himself a work critical of the hedonism that rampantly overtook Spain's own religious traditions. Goya's print depicts a more blatant sexual advance emphasized by the bent figure's hand practically touching the maha skirt, as well as the phallic sword sticking out behind him. Landaluce's replacement of the maha with a mulata makes direct reference to Goya's print, as well as a comparison between the rampant debauchery present in the superstitions of both Spanish and Afro-Cuban society and religious practice. In Preparandose para la Fiesta, or Getting Ready for the Party, Landa Luce depicts a mulata woman with a calicero preparing, her, preparing herself for an evening outing. She's beautifully dressed and the candle on the table in front of her casts a warm glow throughout the room that accentuates the allure of her golden skin. Like the Maha and Goya's two of a kind, the mulata stands in a position almost physically impossible to sustain, displaying her body as sexually attractive to both the calicero and to the viewer. Like their postures in God Forgive Her and It Was Her Mother and Malata y Sudueña, both women press their chests out while the bottom half of their bodies lean backwards with an outstretched fan in one hand. The calicero, like the majo and two of a kind, stands slightly behind but moves towards the mulata, creating a balancing act between their bodies and setting them in visual juxtaposition to one another. They are both positioned as two halves of the same whole, implying a doubled nature to these two pairs that is underscored in Goya's print to his caption, um, in Goya's print by his caption, two of a kind. However, the calicero and maha recede into the background while the maha is thrust forward in black and the mulata in bright pink as the central focus of both images. 
The domestic scenting in Preparándose para la Fiesta is uh, identical to L'Andalusia's watercolor Arreglándose para la Fiesta. Both pictures depict the same woman in her home, possibly one that Lalusse visited in person. Both are intimate portrayals of mulatta woman being observed by the calistero as she makes herself up before the mirror, but equally studies of the domestic details of the mulatta's household. The mirror tilting, tilting forward above the table, the candle lit um, in the bottle on the wooden dressing table covered with a white cloth, as well as the many objects strewn about the room are duplicated in both pictures, such as the yellow shawl and broom leading on the, on the wooden chair, illustrating an interest in the minute details of the mulatta's possessions and the interior of her home. Most of the objects in both images, such as the mirror and chair, as well as the open door, are angled to frame the mulatta and the calicero in the picture center. The calicero faces her in both versions. In the painting, standing behind her and in the watercolor, moving across the room to sit in front of her, as if Landaluce was testing out his role and placement in the scene. By depicting the mulatta in a pastoral domestic setting in a way that Goya does not, Landaluce considers her identity beyond an inhabitant of the streets. In a manner similar to the Maha's popularity as a symbol of Spanish nationalism, mulatta women by the end of the 19th century and the height of Cuba's fight for independence from Spain had also been converted into figures of patriotism. The mulatta's ambiguity as neither fully European nor African, Spanish nor Hispanic, embodies Cuba's cultural uniqueness as well as the future of the racially transformed island. Mulatta women became the inspiration for a generation of 20th century Cuban artists and writers attempting to find Cuban nationalism, such as Victor Manuel La Gitana Tropical, painted in Paris in 1929. Intriguing here is Manuel's decision, um, which I'm happy to go into further in the Q&A, to title his painting here, um, to title his painting of a Cuban mulatta woman, La Gitana Tropical, the Tropical Gypsy. Later in the 20th century, Cuban poet, literary critic, and cultural leader, Roberto Retamar, wrote in his uh, famous Caliban notes toward the discussion of our culture in America, that the mulatta was the embodiment of Jose Martí's Nuestra América Mestizo, and Cuba's racial hybridity as the essence of the island's identity. Uh, in conclusion, I want to turn uh, briefly to our own historical moment. The mulatta has been reincarnated in the 21st century through brands such as Ron Mulatta or Murat Mulatta Rum as the personification of Cuba's tropical leisure and beauty essential to the tourism industry uh, crucial to the island's economic survival. Mulata Rum advertises the mulata as representing um, the fire, the happiness, and the mysticism of Cuba, quoting Cuban poet Nicolas Guyen that Cuba sabe que es mulata, or Cuba knows its mulata, confirming the identity of the island as intertwined with its mixed race Spanish heritage. And actually, this um, mulata run is rum is a is a brand that has um, existed since the uh, late nineteenth century, early twentieth century. Uh, Europe's enthrallment with the Maha's personification personification of Spanishness and the country's sensual allure is mirror is mirrored in Spain's own fascination with the Cuban mulata. Both women could not have been transformed into the infamous international symbols and prototypes of femininity that they are now without Goya or Landaluce's masterful imagery. Thank you all uh, very much. I look forward to your questions.